Okay, so um, thank you. And I think that was a very fabulous morning and um, a really good setup for this panel discussion about equity and practice. Um, so the workplace is one of the principal places where architectural habits are formed, projects created and careers made or broken. The processes, procedures and customs of architectural firms and studios are fundamental to and entwined with architecture's wider cultures. There are many, many different ways to run an architectural practice and many different kinds of workplaces within the profession. The benefits of inclusive workplaces are also indivisible from the larger context of the profession. And conversely, the struggles of the profession are deeply entwined with the difficulties experienced within the workplace. These issues are not only relevant to women in under, uh, underrepresented groups. Poor, poor employment practices, exploitation, unpaid labour enable rampant fee cutting, which places pressure on everybody, as we've just been hearing, and threatens to destroy the future viability and standing of the profession as a whole. This is one of my pet topics. I could go on about this for a very long time. But instead, we're going to talk about how we make the workplaces of the future and the role that workplaces can play in establishing an equitable and robust professional cultures. And there's some really, really great work going on within practices at the moment. And so um, we're here today to hear from four people who are really uh, working very hard in this area and whose practices are making substantial strides. Um, I don't want to set you up as sort of perfect, perfect <laughs> models. Um, and I'm interested to hear about the challenges and the difficulties as well as uh, the things that are working. Um, but we have four, um, four architects, all of whom are involved in really pushing things along within practice. So Brian Clohessy is an architect and head of people and character at BVN. He leads development of the overall vision, strategy and structure for all things people related in the practice. He has a special focus on learning and development, talent management, recruitment and the retention of people. He sees his role as maintaining BVN's evolving culture based on human needs and aspirations which inevitably improve the collective's well-being. Brian's also a male champion of change and so um, I'm sure he will be happy to take questions about that um, organisation, which I should also say I am currently a special advisor to. Stephanie Bullock. Stephanie is founding director of Kosloff Architects here in Melbourne. The practice is a registered B Corp and was founded on the belief that the creation of an authentic and engaged practice culture is integral to producing high quality and lasting architectural design. Stephanie's experience in architecture is complemented by her business skills which she honed in her previous career as a management consultant and project manager in the financial services industry. When I heard Stephanie was a former banker, I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Patty Ree is a partner at Ehrlich Unite Ree Cheney Architects in Los Angeles, um, a practice that received the National AIA Firm Award in 2015. She's a very, very fine designer, um, and, but she also leads the practice's focus on equity and diversity. She's the founding co-chair of the American Institute of Architects Los Angeles Women in Architecture Committee, um, which I had the very lovely pleasure of going to one of their symposia, of speaking at one of their symposia a few years ago. Um, she recently completed USC's Ross Minority Program in Real Estate and is currently on the board of the Culver City Chamber of Commerce. In 2017, she received the Culver City Women in Business Council Visionary Award. Um, and she's also got a very nice slide of dead lions from her children. <laughs> anyway, we can talk about that later. <laughs> Angela Dapper is a uh, principal at Grimshaw in London. She joined Grimshaw earlier this year and prior to that she was a partner at Denton Corker Marshall in London and led the Stonehenge Visitor Centre project, one I think we're all very familiar with. Uh, following that project she was shortlisted for the Architects Journal Emerging Women Architect of the Year in 2014. Uh, she's a contributor to the Mayor of London's Supporting Diversity Handbook and ambassador for the Architects Benevolence Society, which Ben was talking about earlier, and the curator of the 2020 London Festival of Design. So, they're very, four very, very impressive people um, doing really 
extraordinary work within their practices. But I'd just like to start each of them, although I've just introduced them, I'd like to start each of them, uh, ask by starting each, each of them to just talk a little bit about what your practice, you know, the size, scale kind of work you do, because I think one of the things we're really trying to do with Parla is, is just show the kind of range of responses across a range of types of practice. So I'd like you to very briefly talk about that, and also then, I suppose, just locate yourselves rather than through your official bios in relation to the sort of subjects of equity and diversity and, and, and workplace. So, But just very quickly, like five minutes, no more, because I think we've got a lot to talk about in conversation, and I know you have questions for each other, and I have, you know, like, a, basically a whole article of questions, so. <laughs> anyway, Angela. Okay, I'll, I'll kick off, and I think I've got four minutes worth, but you could stop me if I go too far, because I, I do like to talk. Um, <laughs> As Justine said, I'm a, a, a relatively new uh, principal at uh, Grimshaw. I started in uh, January. Uh, we're 340 people in London, uh, and I found the idea of moving to a big firm really interesting. Before that, I spent 14 years at Dental Cork Marshall in London. We're a firm of 30, and that's a very different being. Um, we were always 50-50. I think we were 50-50 gender equity in equality in uh, DCM in London uh, for 12 years or so. And um, actually we didn't need to work very hard. Uh, it happened organically because we were small enough to make it happen and we have enough strong figures to also make that happen. Um, I was completely headhunted to go to Grimshaw. Uh, it took me a little while to be convinced. I was like, why would I want to move? I've got a great job. Um, one of the things that uh, really turned my head was their gender equity policies and not just what they were talking about, but what they were really putting in action, which was a real challenge, I thought, to the to the industry and nothing I would had actually seen before. So it's great to see. And also what happened in the time that we were talking about me taking a position at Grimshaw, um, we got a new female managing uh, partner in London. So we're, we're led by a female. And for me, that really changed things. Although what was interesting to me, and I think it's probably part of my unconscious bias, is I wrongly assumed that these really strong gender equity principles came from the female partner, but they didn't. They actually came from a group of male partners, and I don't think we should overlook the contribution that everyone's making to this topic. Uh, in, in relation to uh, their strategy for gender equity, there's, there's eight key principles in terms of their strategy, but they come down to three main things, which are kind of things that we've, we've covered um, in, a lot in the conference. Uh, number one, we, we measure a lot. We measure everything to just make sure where we're at, and we make sure that everyone's signed up to do that quarterly. Um, so we're constantly reviewing, and when it comes down to promotions and things, we do that. Recruitment. Recruitment's really important in terms of any corrective action you can make. So I was a strategic recruit. So I'm not, you know, so hopefully, I've, you know, I'm not taking out anyone else's possibility for promotion. I'm taking a kind of a side role in there, but kind of helping rebalance some um, uh, senior leadership. The rest of all the policies are around uh, retention of staff because we can see through measuring that we are losing staff and it sounds like uh, in, in Australia you have similar issues. So we, we talk about development, support, mentoring, coaching, advocacy, and then we also have our policies around parental policies and flexible working, um, which we know are um, important in terms of retention of staff. We've had unconscious bias training, but uh, more importantly, I think um, one of the things that really changed the way we recruit was a really simple change by having uh, one female and one male in the room. It changed the amount of women that we recruited very, very quickly, just with such a simple change. And we also know the impact of this because we measure, we keep measuring. And um, it's really important to really understand what the, what the impact of different um, strategies are. Uh, in recent years, we've also realized the value of health and well-being. Uh, so we are supporters of the, I find it really hard to say the name, the Architects Wellbeing Forum. I think there's still another, sorry, Ben. I've missed some, something else in there. Actually, it's Mental Wellbeing. Mental Wellbeing Forum. What a, yeah, sorry. Uh, so we, we support that, and we think this is a, a major driver um, in terms of our diversity and inclusion. Um, and a lot of uh, what we've been putting in place in terms of our strategies, we've been trying to apply to uh, LGBT+, plus in terms of racial equality, um, disability, across the board. And so we found that um, inclusivity for us is really supported by health and wellbeing. We do that by having, um, we've got three mental health uh, first aiders in our office who are continually busy, and it's really great to see that they are being used and people are referring to them, even in small ways. So we're creating that conversation. Something else we also had, which I thought was quite funny when I was uh, looking to work there, we have a resident poet. 
It's, I didn't realize we needed a resident poet, but we have. <laughs> His name is Lionheart. I took Justine to meet him. He's amazing. He does poetry and he gives hugs. And I didn't realize how much we needed both. <laughs> So he sits down with people to talk through their feelings and then um, recites poetry back to us, encapsulating people's feelings or thoughts of what they're talking about. He can recite it back anonymously or with names. And what's quite interesting and what's happening in our office, quite often people are happy to put their name down to deeper issues that they're talking about, which is great. So what it's really doing is creating a conversation to talk about mental health, um, inclusion and well-being in our office. So I'm, I'm loving that and loving the hugs. Um, we also have a number of week-long events in our office where we have Mental Health Week, Diversity and Inclusion Week, Sustainability Week, just to name a few. But these are to create focused discussions around topics, but we're very, very aware that we need to create the forum to allow people to constantly give back information. So it's a two-way conversation. We're not talking down to people. We're also coming from the bottom up. So it's giving people platforms to talk so we can um, constantly review and evolve. Um, a lot of our strategies are inward facing, so we're supportive of our people and we know that as architects, we're only as good as the people in our office. So we need to look after those people. Um, but we're really uh, also focused on outward facing uh, interaction and sharing. So sharing of information is really important. So our eight step strategy for gender equity, um, we have uh, contributed that as a case study to the Mayor of London's uh, diversity handbook. Um, so then other people can use that as a case study um, and develop their own principles. Uh, unfortunately, it was done in 2016, so we haven't included your, I know you've got some brilliant um, uh, principles as well for um, Parla, but we're also using that to help develop the RIBA policies as well. But we're also making sure that we advocate people getting out and talking about different issues and having different people from our office representing us in, in different form forums, which is really important to us. Um, so it's, it's great to see that we are making changes and we feel we're making changes. We're 55% female. Uh, it doesn't mean our gender pay gap stats are that great because the, the females are generally um, at the bottom and actually we're quite bottom heavy uh, in terms of females, but it is great to, um, to work in a quite a strong female culture and it attracts other strong females as well. Uh, my final point is just around uh, flexible working. I think we're a, we're a great creative, innovative industry, but we're still very stuck on very fixed working practices, long hours, and, and we're pretty inflexible when it comes to working. A lot of people, when you talk about flexible work hours, will go, oh yeah, we've got a young mum, we let her work four days a week. It's, I, for me, it's not about that, and I think the next conversations we should be having are about different models of working. Uh, in my last office, we had a mum who was just wanted to work from uh, 10 to 3. You know, she's amazing. She came in, contributed to the team, got everyone working. Why can't you work 10 to 3? Like, why, why are we not uh, adopting these kind of much more flexible, adaptable models of working? And I think that's really where we need to focus in the future. Right, and this is a good point to move to Brian, who has an app for flexible working. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> so as part of in BVN, and we've been looking at this for a while because of the champions of change, is that uh, flexibility is a big part of it. And we launched um, guidelines because you need that clarity. Everybody needs to understand how to go about it. What's the process? How do I apply for it? What does it look like? And we kind of defined all the different types of flexibility, of which that is redistributed hours, if you wanted to do that, reduced hours, working from home. And um, what we found was that there was still a bit of a stigma around it, that people wanted to slink out or they couldn't openly talk about it. So what we developed was... Um, a little app where you log on in the morning and you just say either you're sick or I'm gonna be dropping off the kids in the morning or I go to a doctor's appointment or whatever else and it just, you can say that and then you submit it and what it does is it pulls on our um, little spreadsheet that has all the people who are on leave, who are on parental leave, who are overseas or traveling and it auto generates an email to the entire studios that goes, okay, in the Sydney studio, here's where everyone is in Brisbane and whatever else. And what we found was that over time, as people really bought into it, is you started getting um, more personal stories about plumber coming, we'll work from <laughs> home in the morning, come in at lunchtime. And the beauty of that is it just starts to acknowledge that this is what life looks like. Balancing life looks like all these things. It doesn't have to be around caring. It can be for whatever. And um, 
we had to drive it to from a leadership perspective. Like I get in there and tend to overshare a little bit just to almost make the point of what it is. So I'd say Max is kindy orientation in at 10.30, but it's that thing and it's, it's okay to do that. So that's just one of the aspects I think that we're working through. I think flexibility is still one of the challenges that we have. There's aspects that work incredibly well, but around <clears throat> we're finding especially for um, women who go on parental leave and they're in a project architect role, if they want to come back anything less than full time, it's quite a challenge. And what we're starting to just talk about now in Champions of Change, because we're in a specific flex group, is this idea that we take this scope and before the person goes on leave, we say, here's all the things that I'm doing. What would this look like at three days a week? And what would this look like at four days a week? And let's look for a 2IC partner who you could, we could start to, with enough notice, we could start to divvy that up so that they could do things like that. But, um, <clears throat> so flexibility is a big one. And I think it's interesting because you can say, yes, we do flex, but how well do we do it? And it's, I think it's still, from the conversations we're having at other practices, that's still the challenge for us there. Um, Sorry, I sidetracked you straight into the topic yeah. of your introduce. So I'll, I'll loop back quickly. Yeah. Um, so uh, BVN is a uh, practice we've been around for 95 years. So it's, it, it's, it's got a bit of history there. We are currently 200 in Sydney and 100 in Brisbane and a small presence in London and New York. Um, we have 17 uh, principals who are the partners, and they're all equal owners of the practice, of which five are women, so just around 30%. Not great, but it's getting there, heading in the right direction. Our principals are very much um, in projects still and hands-on in teams and, and, and part of the everyday of the studio. We have our co-CEO, uh, one of them is Nenashka, which is great. And the difference of when you have someone at the head of the practice is that suddenly in every key announcement, you have a woman standing up and doing it, which is, it makes a bit, there's subtle things, but they're all the little things that just start to see. But because I'd like to think that as we all enter the practice, you can see women in leadership. And the interesting thing is when I got involved in Champions of Change, we went back and we looked at when you guys started doing the research and way back when it was like, um, I think 2005, and it was like 1% of owners in Australian practice were women. In BVN, it was 30% at that time, but the pipeline was dreadful. Mm. Like it was, it, they had it there, but the, like it just, it wasn't sustainable. It was, and interesting, we haven't really shifted in that time, as in at the ownership model. I think we've tidied some things up and we're getting better, but it's just fascinating that even back then it was, it was quite positive. Um, so that's the diversity. We're quite fortunate in diversity of work um, in, in scale and typology that we do. And I guess that allows us to and the importance with culture is to try and keep rather than an up and down scale that you, you got to work really hard with culturally to try and keep, keep the, the size of the practice uh, um, th as you ride out the various um, projects. And I think our diversity allows us to do that, which is really important to us. Um, and <coughs> we were public and private sector, which is great. And the other thing is that within the studio, there isn't sectors, so you're not, you don't have an education sector or a, um, a health or a commercial sector. So a lot of the people who come into BVN like the idea that they could be working on a, a research and laboratory building and they could be in a library and then suddenly they could be doing a workplace or do whatever else. Of course, there are some specialists in there, but that's, I think, um, a unique thing that we, we, we enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and my side of it is, um, Architect came to BVN in 2005, so when I joined the Sydney studio, it was 55 or so, so I've seen it grow quite a bit and been part of that. Um, worked in projects, always really enjoyed the stakeholder engagement, how we collaborate with consultants, managing clients, that aspect of it, so I think I had an affinity for people. And in 2015, I took on, I kind of transitioned from projects into this studio director role, which is kind of, I guess, the man, practice manager type role in, in Sydney. And um, that for me was, so if, if we look at the mantra, what that means is we, in that role, you're responsible for the health of all aspects of the studio. So that means from a project perspective, so operationally and from a people side of things. So I really enjoyed getting into the nuts and bolts of the studio and that. And what we recognized is as, if you like, cultures and the um, almost the demands of that we need to meet for our people to serve them the right way and care for them and support them is that 
if you're just if if you're distracted in projects and in people we weren't getting to a strategy level where we were going, okay, well, let's look at what are the issues, what are the fundamental causes of that. So we, we could surface things, but we couldn't find the space in, in our day-to-day -day role to actually do anything about it. So in the middle of this year, we created this new role of head of people character, work with Isabella's here, and that's our focus. So we look at that side of things from a structural point. So that's it. Excellent. Stephanie. Uh, so our practice was founded just over two years ago and we now have 15 in the practice, so it's been a fairly rapid period of growth, it's fair to say. Uh, the work that we do is primarily focused on the public sector, so we do a lot of educational work in both sort of the sort of state school system but also tertiary education as well, so both universities and TAFE, but we also do some commercial work which is very much focused on the public realm. Uh, in terms of my own background, as Justine mentioned, I have a dark past. Uh, I used to work in banking and finance and I did that for around 10 years. I was a, a project manager in strategic projects and change management and I only started studying architecture after I had my first child. So the majority of my architectural career I've actually worked part-time. I've only really worked full-time for the past five years or so. And I must admit, I mean, it's 20 years since I worked in banking, but when I first moved into architecture, I actually found it relatively enlightened compared to where I'd come from, so that's probably a little bit um, unusual. Um, but, you know, there's obviously still an enormous amount of, of work to do. Uh, in terms of our practice, one of the things that we were very clear about when we first founded it is that we wanted it to be a B Corporation or B Corp, and I'm not sure how much people know about that, I'll just talk very briefly about it. So it's effectively an independent certification for ethical and sustainable business. It's a, a global um, framework that you can adhere to and fundamentally it's about the idea that you can balance profit and purpose so you, those things don't need to be contradictory essentially. And you get certified by uh, going through a whole process of answering questions and you get points. You have to get a certain number of points to certify. There's nothing that's prescribed. Uh, the areas it covers are things like environmental impact, the impact you have within your community which is a lot about social procurement, uh, governance. So do you have a mission that it's about more than profit? Is it about impact. Uh, also in terms of the type of work that you do, so if you focus in sort of improving educational outcomes or health, you get points for that. And lastly and most relevant to this discussion around how you treat the people within the practice, so workplace practices as well. So I thought I might just talk briefly about what that means. Uh, so the types of areas it looks at, and again, none of these are prescribed, so the idea is that you know you sort of note how you do things and you get points effectively. Uh, so it's very much an opt-in sort of system. So you know, a lot of this is quite basic sort of stuff. Um, so things like, you know, making sure not only are you paying above the award, but are you paying sort of industry rates as well and how do you actually measure that? So, you know, we make sure we subscribe to all the relevant surveys and we share that with staff and that frames up discussions about starting salaries, but also ongoing salary reviews as well. Uh, looking at the sort of benefits that you offer people and making sure that's, that's done in an equitable manner. So we offer a minimum five weeks annual leave to everybody within the practice as well. You know, making sure that everybody again has access to the same benefits you know, instead of subsidising, you know, professional training and development in a really structured but also equitable way. So having a really clear strategy and looking at, you know, who is getting access to training, is it personalised to them and again, does everybody have the same opportunities within that? Uh, it also looks at a whole range of things around work environments, so, you know, simple things like having clear policies that are in an employee handbook that people can look at around, you know, sort of leave and entitlements and things like that, dispute resolution, codes of ethics and so forth. Uh, we do uh, engagement surveys, so we, we do anonymous surveys every year where we ask people how they're finding the experience of working within the practice and that looks at not only people's own experience in terms of opportunities for growth and finding meaning in their work but also their opinion as to how uh, other people are finding that experience as well. So it asks questions like, you know, do you feel as though you have opportunities for growth within the practice? Do you feel that everyone within the practice has those opportunities? So again, trying to get, you know, feedback from people about, um, so that we can improve effectively. Uh, the other sorts of things we've looked at, flexible working arrangements, is, is a really big thing for us. It's a lot easier with 15 people um, to sort of manage that, although I love the app and I really mm. want to hear more about that as well. You know, so making sure everybody has a laptop and that you have the system set up so you can work from anywhere as well. And as you said, making sure people feel that they're encouraged to do that so you don't need to come up with a valid reason to, um, to come in late or to leave early or to swap your days around, that you know, everybody within the practice is making use of, of, that, um, of those opportunities as well. Um, the final thing that I want to talk about, which is again aligned with the, the B Corp framework, 
And I should say just before that, I think it's really important to challenge the idea that you know having equitable work practices and really good benefits and so forth is some sort of a luxury item that mm -hmm. only large practices can afford. Yep. It's just simply not true. Uh, you know, we, so we do Why sort you're of. Here. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think it's actually those things are complementary. You know, and a lot of it is is about you know attracting the best people as well, and that's how you do the best work. And there's a huge shift that we're seeing over the last few years in terms of social procurement, the sort of questions that we're being asked on tenders, you know, in terms of government and also universities as well, you know, you need to be able to have answers to these questions. They want to know, you know, um, how are you actually managing your business, how are you treating people. The final thing I want to talk about is that uh, within B Corp, there's a strong focus on worker ownership so that you can get a significant number of points if you are open to the idea of sharing ownership with your employees and even beyond that, actually transferring ownership over time as well. And this is an idea that... Uh, that I've always been very personally interested in myself and so we've been working on that really since we started so it's required a lot of work looking at ownership models and um, a lot of time and money with lawyers uh, rewriting shareholders agreements effectively so we're restructuring our practice so that we can offer shares to all of our employees and we've also developed a long-term plan in terms of how we will gradually dilute the ownership of the two founding directors over time. Some of our reasons for doing that are quite self-interested, to be honest. You know, when you start a practice, you know, sort of mid-career, you, know, you need to think about what's going to happen in 15 to 20 years' time. And we're aware of a number of instances where really successful practices, the, the founders go to retire and, and nobody wants it. You know, nobody, <laughs> it's sort of like, take my practice, please. And, 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 and people don't want to take that on because if you wait until that point, it's really too late. So we really wanted to think about, you know, how do we actually build our succession plan as we go? Because you need to do that from the outset. You know, it's also obviously about looking to attract the very best people and to retain them for as long as possible because if they're really ambitious and engaged, you know, there's obviously a drive potentially to found your own practice, but we're interested in perhaps providing another pathway to ownership that might be between those two things, being an employee and starting your own practice. But I guess really fundamentally, as I said, it's about you know, it a, a belief that this is the right thing to do. I've had the experience of um, being an employee and also uh, being an owner, and at times both of those things simultaneously, and I've <laughs> moved between those two states as well. And so for me, it's really important to have a process for that that's very transparent and very explicit and very clear, because otherwise it's very difficult for people to make really good decisions about their long-term career prospects. And I, I don't believe it's reasonable to ask somebody to devote a significant part of their working life to you in your practice without being able to give them an idea as to what that might mean for them personally. Uh, and all of this really, I think, is, um, is around you know, aligning the interests of the people that work within a practice with the interests of the practice. And I think the best way to do that is by actually breaking down the, the distinction between the two, the idea that if we really are wanting to build these kind of collectives of really passionate people, you know, why should there be a really hard line between those two states? Excellent. And I think that's a, something that I'm interested in talking about more. And I know um, Jude Barber, who's speaking this afternoon, is also a director of Collective Architecture in Glasgow, which has been going through a lot of these similar questions about employee ownership. So, um, Jude, you might have something to say from the audience in a little while. <laughs> anyway, Patty. <laughs> um, so mine should be pretty quick. <laughs> but um, just a little bit about my background. I'm from L.A., our office... Ehrlich and I retaining architects. It was originally Stephen Ehrlich Architects, which was the sole proprietorship. We just uh, had our 40th year birthday anniversary. And um, it's a medium-sized firm of about 44 people, primarily in the LA office, but we also have a small office in San Francisco. And we are a very design-focused firm. And I would say we do everything from custom house to warehouse to courthouse to house of parliament. That's kind of what we've said. Um, range of scales, uh, very broad portfolio. Um, but given the size, it's been able to be quite an intimate, more like familiar uh, atmosphere. Culture is really important to us. Um, but also being a medium-sized firm, uh, and on the one hand, like, um, uh, Angela, you mentioned it's a lot easier because you can control more. But on the other hand, it's like you're, everyone is so busy. And to be able to take on all these other issues that we care about is um, you're kind of scrambling to find the time to do that. So I, I have a great deal of respect for how everyone can do these things. Um, the 
office is I'm currently a partner with uh, three others, including the founder, founding partner, Stephen, and we did go through a transition period, which was interesting. But um, I think the most fortunate thing that I look back on was that I was able to land in a place and get a sense that it was a good environment for myself. And I don't think I consciously thought of it as like, it's gonna be a good place for a woman. I just thought it was a good place for me and I could foresee, you know, I could be here a long time. And I do feel like, I don't know how many students are out there, but um, that was never anything that was, I was prepared for mm. in school. And I hope schools are doing a better job of, you know, preparing their students for that um, because that has, is so important when one is looking for a job or when one is seeking to change because it's not uh, always such a great feeling. To, it's a, There's a lot of risk involved when you're looking for that first job or the second job or whatever it is and to really do your homework and know what you're getting into is, is really important. Okay, now as I said I have Lots of questions, but I also, you told, you guys told me you're just going to ask each other questions. <laughs> so do you want to just kick off with that and I'll kick, come in with mine if I, um, if, if things, you know, if you run out of things to say? Or? I think it'd be interesting to talk more about, I like the app. I like the app, Grimshaw people here. <laughs> I like the app. Um, I think the, the idea of talking about flexible working is really interesting to me. Um, it was, it was really funny, uh, not funny, but um, having uh, look, looking at a new job this year, and, pe and people tell you all the time, oh yeah, we've got these flexible working policies. Do you know, everyone has a flexible working policy, and it's how we apply it, which is so, so different. And I think um, that understanding um, that Brian was just saying before about, you know, I'm late because of, you know, I'm late because my shoe broke. Like, you know, it doesn't matter why, like, you know, we are late and we, do, we don't have to all start work at nine o'clock. Like, we're very fixated on that. I think the idea of um, flexibility, being able to be late, but doing things in our own time. Like, I drop my kids at school every morning and I used to find myself, and I, even though I had the agency to do that at my last firm, I was always half an hour late. So I'm like, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. You know, no, I, no, it was fine, but I always felt guilty. Now I start at 9.30, it's like, I'm here like everyone else, but I can still drop my kids at school. You know, there's just part of my life, and I think it's when life intersects work. It needs to just work for all of us. But um, I'd be interested to talk a little bit more about that at um, BVM and BVN and how you, how, how you manage that in terms of um, that whole day. I know the app kind of deals with yep. early in the day. Like, yep. what does that mean in terms yep. of models? And I think before you can, it's interesting. So um, Bianca, who was, is now at SJB, who is here, and when we sat down, when she was with BVN, and we sat down and we started looking at Flex initially. And it's funny, you can't look at it in isolation because as she said to me, she goes, if we, do, if we look at flex, we've got to actually look at long hours and time loo. Yep. They're, yeah, they're yes. intertwined. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely intertwined. So when we launched um, our flex guidelines, we also, and I don't know who else has done this, but we have grasped the nettle. We, we defined um, reasonable overtime. We just took it on. We just said, we're going to define it so that we just, we're going to take that ambiguity out. We're going to try and get a fairness across all projects between project leaders. There's no more interpretation about what it looks like. This is what it is. And in talking to project leaders, they love it because project comes up. And the key to this is you, you, you cannot work overtime unless you get permission from the project leader first. So you can't just stay back and then mm. come in the next day and you look exhausted and why did this happen? So, and with that, then linked to that is, through Delta and Vision, where we do, um, uh, and I'm rambling, but I'll come back to it, in, in timesheets, because again, it comes back to, then you've got to get the culture of people recording time accurately, have to do that, because otherwise, how do we monitor it? So we're trying to do, um, so what we do now is reports for the studio on, and we've got a sophisticated enough where if you're working part-time, it will calculate what your reasonable time will be pro rata over that so we can just do a little graph to go, okay, we need to go and talk to these people and understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And are they taking the time off? Because as we talked and Ben talked about, again, mental well-being is all linked to this because for those people who, it's often very um, anxious trying to get flex around and feel mm -hmm. the guilt that mums feel in leaving at a certain time is also all these things are intertwined. So you can't just take off and 
put all your focus on one, I think we have to look across because what also came into it was when people are, are, are unwell and the amount of times we had to talk to them about that illness, sick in your time, or in your time sheet doesn't come in minimum eight hour blocks. You might feel unwell in the morning, mm -hmm. but you might feel okay in the afternoon to just log on and start to work from home and that's yeah. fine. So it's that idea that, and choice, it was the other story around Flex is really good because as you create the technology to allow people to work anywhere. And we have Citrix, so you can log on anywhere as long as you have a good internet and you can work. Now, the danger in that is people can be remote and you, you don't see them, so you don't know. So you're trusting mm -hmm. that they log the hours and do it. But people say, well, we shouldn't send emails after 10 o'clock or we shouldn't do this or that. And I went, well, that's true. But um, Kim told me as a working mom said, she goes and she collects her kids. She goes home, she looks after them, she gets them all done dusted. Then she has dinner with her partner, and then she logs on. And she said, it's by choice. It's not, there's an issue that I'm there. It's, that's mm. how I want to live my life. So, and I think that's what we need to look at. Is like, yeah. it's the, we have to get over what is normal hours. Yep. Because the minute you, you understand that in real flex, people work differently. They might start at seven. They might start at six in the morning, go home early by choice. And to be clear, the key thing we said to people with flex is this is not for parents or people with caring responsibilities. We had one girl who was training for an Ironman competition. She wanted to do stuff around that. We have people who want to teach. We have people who want to just go and do stuff. And that's fine. And it's not this thing where it's frowned upon because it's only for that. And I think you've got to... So where I'm getting to is the app, and we talked about it in the Champions of Change, and as I said, it just suits our culture. And it took a long time of people starting to get more familiar with it and, and more comfortable to do it. But it needs all these things you need a good guideline that makes it very clear so that there's no ambiguity, you define it, you say that if you work part-time. Um, and then we had to look at it and say, well, what happened if you're asked to come in and work, say, if I work Monday to Wednesday and I'm asked to come in and work on Thursday? And it was, oh, is that time and lose that? No, we said, no, that's, they'll be paid for that day. So you give them that assurance because they often have to pay for childcare and do whatever else. So, and the thing with it is, you have to, and back to this perfectionist thing, we have this thing where we hold off trying to get it perfect before you launch it. Mm. Just get it out there. Yep. Because what will happen is, mm. in we call it a live doc, as we get feedback, we really adjust it and tweak yeah. it. You've got to live it. And the thing is, when Bianca and I started that, that was a couple of years ago, it took us two years of living it to actually get to the point where we went, okay, now it's, it suits what we understand or people need right now, but not fully. And the other thing is how you communicate it. And it's not a soft launch. We did a big launch. We did clinics in both studios where we talked about it. One hour sessions, people could come and ask questions. And questions came that we weren't expecting. And we actually solved it there and then and everyone heard it and they felt pretty good about it. So you got to kind of interact with them and do it. So I would say with the Flex is be prepared for it. And evol it's continually evolving. Your people will kind of tell you what it needs to do and what it has to do. And um, yeah, just be, I think if you come at it and you just say, this is what we think is fair and reasonable. This is our approach. If you always come at it like that, I think you, mm. there's good buy-in. People are like, okay, I get it. So, Patty, I know one thing you did was um, you employed a studio manager for the first time when mm -hmm. you just... So when I first met Patty, she gave this most extraordinary presentation on her work, which was very beautiful, but it also included a drawing your daughter had done of a dead lion. <laughs> because <laughs> your daughter... It was Mummy's got a dead lion. <laughs> I have to go to the office for Your, deadlines, and yeah. finally I found out she thought oh. I meant dead lions, and it was, I was just like, what are you thinking? Uh. <laughs> she drew a very cute sketch of it. And <laughs> anyway, I know you're more than your daughter's drawings, <laughs> you know, I don't think I am. Um, um, but can you tell, I mean, you, as a sort of, a smallish practice. Mm -hmm. You were kind of running things all yourselves as directors, mm -hmm. and and then you at one point decided that you actually needed, and so mm -hmm. and that I think your ex I'm just talking for you now. <laughs> your experience was that also people went to um, that person with questions they may not have come to you with as directors. I just wondered if you might talk about. Yeah, I this. think back then it was. Um I mean, a lot of small practices go through this. They don't have that many overhead positions, so they have to take all that kind of management and HR and all the things that we're not at all trained to do. Mm. Um, we take that all on. And I spoke to a, a business coach, which was also something that someone recommended 
us to do, and they were like, this is the kind of position that you really need. So we did bring someone like that on, and it was just a world of help, because it freed us up to do the things that we were actually really good at doing, like designing or client relations or whatever that might be, and um, had someone that was actually skilled at doing the HR and, and the, the relations between within the office, they, they were able to take that on. But um, something I did want to comment on was just like this idea of the long hours culture because I lived through that in school, as I'm sure a lot of you did, and I love the camaraderie. I love that feeling, and I, I really missed it when I had my kids, and it was torture. I mean, of all the things to be tortured up, that was the thing that really um, I missed so much. I'm also, I am a workaholic, and I think this goes back to your point about being flexible about the way people work, because not everybody works the same way. And I don't think it's um, helpful for us to say, well, you shouldn't be a workaholic. I don't know, I mean, people, sh you know, if they really get joy out of it, I think they should have the freedom to do that. So within our office, what we try to do is give people a lot of choices, a lot of options, and whatever it is that they feel comfortable with, they can talk to us about it, and we try to be as flexible as we can. So whether that's, um, so we do have like a, a core hours policy, that's what we call it, so like within certain hours you're supposed to be in the office, um, and then during, we have summer hours, so like every Friday, you can work your 40 hour week within four days versus five. But then there's also things where, you know, it's not kids, but people have ailing parents, or just life happens, and I think the key is just trust and communication, and that goes like such a long way. I feel like. No, I think the thing. Um, I think there's. I think there's very different ways that the long hours stuff plays out. So, I mean, goodness, I've been working very long hours to make this thing happen, <laughs> but I'm not going to be working those really long hours for the next five years. Well, maybe I am, um, but it. it I think it's about when it's in, when it, about the difference between meeting specific needs and that being understood and respected and um, compensated for, and um, businesses being run on the assumption that everybody will be there forever and that you can put your fee bids in on the basis of assuming a whole lot of unpaid work. I think mm -hmm. that's a very different structural circumstance, and I don't I, I don't. Well, certainly my position would never be you work, everyone's got to work nine to five, but that, but that you can't build a business that's based on exploitation, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that that levels of exp and, and that those levels of exploitation also, um, you know, leads to all the mental health problems we're talking about. It leads presenteeism. It's not a great way to get good work, having exhausted people who aren't very happy being there. But, yeah, absolutely the adrenaline of getting it going. So it's, it's this real, and, and I think one of the big things we have to kind of disentangle too is that somehow having, having sensible and reasonable workplace environments is only for those who don't care about design. And, you know, I mean, quite frankly. <laughs> but surely but it's the opposite. I think exactly. ben, ben had a stat that if you work over 40 hours, you know, your, your creativity and, and innovation just drops off. And you know, and that's what we pride ourselves on. You're just like, hang on a minute. Like, if we can be innovative in five hours, why are we working 12? Like, no <laughs> one's innovative at like 2 a.m. We're just kind of falling over. What is the end the observation that you made earlier around how moms are super affecting it? Because they know they cannot stay late. They just, they know the stuff they got to cut out. They prioritize what needs to be prioritized and they get it done. And yeah. that's what we should be rewarding, effectiveness. Yeah. It's Absolutely. almost like, I almost feel like you should be going in and in the people who are sitting there late going, yep. what have you done wrong that you're still here now? But yes. I mean, if you flip, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but if you flipped it like yep. that in the mentality, yeah. but it's a different thing. And it's, it's the idea of, and balance, and that's why I use balance, because balance, Patty, it, it's different to different people. And that's yep. all right. And as long as you're checking and having conversations and doing it, but the ability for us to be more creative people is get out and explore and see the world and get your creative juices yep. flowing so you can come back in and be the best person you can be in, in whatever way you're doing it and the other side of it with the me mental uh, well-being aspect of it is that in that creative side of your brain and stress and anxiety starts to shut down and do it so mm. that's what we should look at as we if we're all passionate about design we should be looking at all the things that curtail it and then if we looked at it like that and say, because in essence, as architects, we all strive to do better work. Mm -hmm. Well, I, show me people who don't, but that's what we, in essence, what we do. If we looked at it like that, and it's, the answer to better work isn't longer ours. 
it's look at all these problems, all these mm -hmm. roadblocks or all these challenges that yeah. diminish it. Yep. And if we, I, and that's the thing about as we sit here and as we, like Sharon, as you said last night, and you talked about, am I an architect if you judge me and what I do? And I go, the design of our practices as, as a problem solver and designer, I go, that's a fantastic thing for us to work on and put our energy and passion into and let us be judged on that aspect of us, not just award-winning projects. And this thing where by awards, people are judged and things are successful. And I've always said, if we half kill the team of people to get there, I don't care if it's won a thousand awards, that's not a successful project. I totally agree. And we need to, and we need to hold each other to account on stuff like that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to oh, this? Well, I was just going to say, you know, I think it's a problem that needs to be tackled at a number of levels, and it does start with um, with school in terms of architectural um, <coughs> universities. I, mean, I was just remembering that when I sat my uh, interview to get into um, architecture, my daughter was six months old at the time, and it must have come up as part of the, you know, tell us a bit about yourself. And the interviewer actually said to me, how on earth do you think you were going to manage to do this degree with a baby? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, which my response to that, I think, was something along the lines of that is none of your concern. But I must admit, I also thought, well, now they have to let me in. <laughs> because, you know, it's such an inappropriate question. Um, <laughs> that's reframing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I did get in. Um, and I have to be honest, I never did an all-nighter, not once. Uh, and, you know, it just wasn't necessary. So a lot of it is about, you know, the expectations that you set up for yourself. You know, I certainly never found working part-time um, to be a barrier in terms of my advancement or anything like that. I think I was very lucky in terms of the environments that I was in. But, you know, it is a lot about your mindset. And I agree with you in terms of I think that, you know, I must admit when I am speaking to somebody and, and they want to work part-time and they're a mother, I do go, yes, excellent, because I know that they know what's important. They know how to prioritise things, you know, because I, th I think that's my experience as well. Mm. Mm. My dad always used to say, actually, that the best people to employ were women returning. Mm. I, I just, anyway, go, Dad. <laughs> um, the other comment that we often get is, oh, it's the client's fault. The client's putting so much pressure on us. And, you know, I'm sure they do. But, I mean, I think hey, maybe I would, I would... I think we also have some very progressive clients, some clients who are going, why... Why are there no women in the room at this presentation? Um, so it, it depends on the kind of client. Um, but I suppose what's your response to that? Well, we can't we can't do all of these things because our clients are too mean to us. I mean, I think to a certain <laughs> certain degree, we need to pick our clients, and I know that's tough as architects. But unless we're doing that, and we need to do it as a profession, and we need to be strong, and we can't have people in the armour that say we're not going to pay our staff because we want to do this. Actually, we need to have value in the profession, and that's really, really important. And so we do this thing where we're, I, you know, I walk past desks where people are there late, going, "What are you doing? Why are you here late? What's gone wrong? Like, what has happened? Have we have we underbid this? Have we undermanaged this? Is it poor leadership? Is it poor fees? Where have we gone wrong for this to happen?" And, and sometimes it is people that want to work like fine, but normally it's not. Normally it's it's because the fees have not allowed it to happen. And then we go back, and and our clients actually they if, if you push it back to the clients, they don't want to be the people that are going, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, you know, like we're not going to allow you to do a good job. If you really press them on it, most of the clients will come back and go, actually, we want to be great clients. We um I had a business coach. I think it's I, I, you know I I'm so for coaching. He was like, give your clients, because I had some shit clients. We, <laughs> we give your clients like a, a, a rating. And then, um, and so I said to one of my clients, he was literally, he was begging me to do this project. I'm like, I'm not doing it. You fired me last time. Like, why would I come back? Like, you didn't pay me and you fired me and you want me to come back and do this project. And then I went, you're on our rating. You're a D. He's like, <laughs> he's like, oh my goodness, what do I have to do to be an A client? And it's really interesting. And my coach told me this. He goes, you'll be surprised. People always want to be the best. Yeah. Clients have so much ego. It's just like, make them work harder. Why wouldn't we make them work harder? And I think that's what we need to do as, as professionals for our profession, mm -hmm. to make architecture a better profession for all of us. But we also need to do this with sustainability. We're not going to get anywhere in sustainability if we're doing exactly that. So I think we need to come together as a profession and do things better. I totally agree. I wish I had a pen because I want to write down all these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but grading the clients, but I mean, seriously, the, it's not only the fees. I mean, if the fees are that bad, we should just not take the jobs. And if they're asking us to do free work, we should just say no. I know that's really hard to do. And it takes, you know, you, you have to be in a position where you're not desperate for the work. But I have found that when I'm struggling with it, 
with a client that I just know is not the right fit for us, mm -hmm. as soon as we break up or whatever you want to call it, it's the best feeling in the world mm -hmm. and the morale of your team just skyrockets. So I feel like... But there's also it. some weirdly an association between some of our best projects we've done have been with the best clients. So quite often you're working with a shitty client and a shitty project. So you're like, why do we, yeah. why do, we do this? And they're probably actually the projects we're more likely to lose money on. Yeah. And you always know too, don't you no. think? You always, at the start, you know, no, it's like when somebody says, I'm not going to rip you off, you know they're going to rip you off. No. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, you know at the start when it's not right and yet you talk yourself into it sometimes because as you say, you sort of, you know, it'll be okay and we can, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> but also clients are not looking for the cheapest. I mean, they always say that, okay, you lost because you're expensive. But you know, if you're going out for a, a, a mobile phone, you're not going to buy, you know, you're not buying a Nokia 3310 or whatever they're called. You know, you're... <laughs> You know, you're not going for the cheapest because you want a certain level and you know someone's coming to you because they want your service mm -hmm. and then they're just kind of being a little bit tricky about it but you're just like actually you want my service this is how much it costs if you really want that that's what it costs totally agree sorry ran over <laughs> sorry I'm just juggling my life my daughter keeps ringing me <laughs> I hope it's just because she wants to ask if she can buy some shoes rather than something else <laughs> anyway Maram can you ring Lily <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, God. Ask each other a question. <laughs> Where are we? Okay, so I'm interested also, each of um, you all to some extent also have a kind of public role talking about these things. Um, Brian, we're going to have to ask you about Champions of Change. Um, and I, I mean, I'm really interested to know, I mean, I sit in those meetings and they're quite, it's quite extraordinary, um, some of the discussions. I think it's very impressive. Um, there's also not that many of them here, which, you know, could have been a better thing. But so what has that, how have you found that that's been useful to the practice? And I suppose also what do you see as the limitations of the program? Um, so I think we've been involved now since 2015 and I think personally, and this is interesting because I was having a chat to uh, Ben Green from Zanis who's started in the last year in it, is and it's a degree of naivety, you go, oh yeah, I think we're pretty, as you went into it, you're like, I think we're pretty good. I like, you think, oh yeah, I think we're all right. Like, if you look around, it, it, the feel is okay, but it's not until you really look at it and somebody gives you the framework and say, here is how you're going to judge yourself on this, and you go, oh shit, we've a bit of work to do. And um, the first thing in Males Champions Change is you actually do listening and learning. You actually sit down with your practice and they get a chance to tell you how things are. And of course, I know culturally, that depends on, the honesty of that depends on what kind of culture you have, but people thankfully took the opportunity to really tell us where we could improve. So I think <clears throat> it was a really good thing, and with Dr. Jess Murphy who facilitates it, you start to get a framework about, okay, here's some actions and we gotta get on with it. And as much as we all went, oh, people were flex, they didn't like, they, didn't, they might have in the, in terms of a time arrival and departure time, but it wasn't. So there was all these things that we actually had to understand what real, what does successful flex look like, mm -hmm. had to start understanding all the issues. So the, the, the weirdly satisfying thing was for the first time f to have a group of competitors come together to problem solve together as a collective is really refreshing. Mm -hmm. And it's a very open forum. And the only, the other thing that we have close to that in Sydney and Steph, we were talking about last night is we have an HR large practice forum in, Sydney, and it is very, it's very supportive and caring sharing, and it's that thing where without giving away anything too serious about the practice, you can talk about stuff where we try to help each other. So I think it's great that we come together as problem solvers to try and do it. Um, so the thing is, and people go, well, who's accountable and what does it mean? So as a champion, I'm accountable. So what we did was we produced a document um, which said, here are all the initiatives, here's how we're implementing it, and here's the outcomes we're looking for. And we've put it on a part of the internet, and in essence, in the intro, we kind of go, you can hold me, to, you can go through this and hold, hold me to account on any aspects you don't see that we're doing well in it. So, as a program, I think it's very good. It's, it's still uncomfortable with the male champions of change, and I've dropped the male bit from when I talk about it, I'm, and yes, why is there male there? And you've got to see, too, a lot of practices, there are no females, that they, 
in the ownership side of it. So it's very difficult to make change unless you have some of the us white middle-aged men starting to try and do it. And um, so for us, I very quickly kind of co-nominated a couple of female principals in the office as fellow champions, and they could talk about that and do it. So um, as a process, I think it's good. It takes a lot of effort and work, and I think from a personal perspective, the challenge I had was initially it was another thing to do on my checklist. I was running projects and doing it, and it's kind of, I'll get to it, and our oh, next meeting's coming up, and you take that approach, I get to do it. And it took me, I had to uh, hold the mirror up to myself and go, well, why, why am I bothering to do this? And I suddenly went, I need to kind of get a new lens. I need to look at everything, like this needs to be something I see in everything I do. And it took a little bit of work. It took me to uh, like a bit of discipline to start to do that. And then once you get that, I think that's when change starts to come because you're, actually, you're looking at all, everything. Like I'll walk past the meeting room and I'll go, all these men inside there and I'm like, and it's like, we're the problem, the consultant teams are the problem, the client's problem, it's like we're all the problem, but, the, and it's the thing, um, Bianca was talking funnily, she said she took the Sydney flight yesterday morning from seven o'clock and she said she was in the back row and it was all, the entire flight was white, middle-aged men. Mm -hmm. And I went, and I bet you they didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. They don't sit there and go, oh, this flight's full of middle -aged. They don't even notice it. <laughs> And that's part of the problem. So the point comes to, and for those of you out there and do it, I get angry too. And it's good. You need men to get angry too. They have to get angry. We have to, you, you have to be aware of it. You have to see this stuff. And that's my point around the lens. So if I say anything for the male champions of change is once you get people in a, pos in a position of influence that see stuff, mm -hmm. I think then you go, we actually have a problem. Mm -hmm. And then you can go about solving it. Because I think naively you'd say we don't really, because you don't, they don't see it. We don't see it, so mm. if you look at it, and, and don't get me wrong, we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. But I, I would like to think we're a better practice than we were four years ago. Mm. So I'm going to ask you the really hard question that people keep asking me is that you did lose quite a few senior women a few years ago, yep. and what did you do about that? Um, <laughs> a couple of things. Um, Firstly, you noticed. I did, <laughs> and I was tracking it, and I'd held it up to the principals and said, are we going to talk about this? Um, the other thing is, as part of what we do, is we do exit interviews. And it's really important because people talk about the life cycle of, and, and in practice. And if we do it really well, and that's for how we go out and find people, induct them, do stuff, and then leave. But we should, people should leave in a fairly positive note. Because like, they're a brand ambassador for you. Beyond that, and I think, and back to the questions yesterday on scale of stuff, the more people in bigger practices who are... Um, exposed to, hopefully, how we do things or how you could do things well and go off and start their own practices or go into other scale practices, they'll start to influence that and do it. So it's really important about how people leave. So we did exit interviews. I, there was one going, what's the point? They know all the issues. And I say, well, I want to be clear on it because I, if, if, if I'm going to help make any change here, I need to understand all the aspects and the reasons for why you did it. So that helped to a degree because with all the unconscious bias and different things, people have views of people and there's that, uh, when people break up, they're, oh, they weren't right for us anyway. So you, there's a tendency to do that, to kind of look at it like that, whereas I'm going, no, there's talent and experience that's walked out there, let's understand why, why that happened. Um, so yeah, I continually show that as it expands, I keep going, just so you know, here's, it's crude terminology, here's the pipeline of the practice, and here's where we've lost from it. And let's understand that, what, like, why is that? Or um, how would we, how do we ensure that the next group coming through don't um, move out of practice? So did I say we solved it in any way? Not necessarily, but, were the, but I did make it did awkward. Did you identify specific, were there specific things that? Yeah, I think it comes, it's interesting. It, I think it comes back to uh, this morning's session around their skills not being valued. Yep. I think that was my, uh, my takeaway from that is that's actually the crux of it. Yep. Because if, you, if they did, if we did, it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. So I'm interested to know, um, I am really, I mean, I look, you're all doing extraordinary things. So, but I'm really interested to know where, where the where, what, where are the difficulties? Where have you kind of, 
where have you tried something and hasn't worked, or where have you? I mean, I'm also interested to know where where you've been surprised by things that have worked. But you know, where have the kind of particular points of tension been? Like, I, I think. I mean. I think one thing we need to address, and this is why I want to start talking more about inclusivity and, and, and people, because, I mean, we, we had a big discussion in our office about intersectionality the other week. It was, it was brilliant. It was so well attended. We accidentally got 250 people. <laughs> our SVP were like, oh, shit. And, you know, so, so we had to buy some more Prosecco. But the, um, <laughs> they, it was brilliant, because everyone was like, what is that? And what, what it really shows is it's a really granular approach to people, because it's just like, I think... What the, you know, m middle class white males are getting, you know, they feel like they're getting a bashing and they feel like they're getting kind of getting um, ostracized. And then you're just like, actually, we have our issues as well. I come from a low socioeconomic background. I come from this, you know, this happened. And so when you start looking at intersectionality of these issues, um, it becomes a really interesting mix. Um, so, and I think that's one area where uh, we, we look at promotion and we look at promotion of women and taking them on a journey. And we've got all these men going, so we lost one of our quite senior males uh, recently who just went, I've had enough, like, you know, where are my opportunities? Mm. And you're just like, well, actually, that's not, and, 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 you know, perhaps that was our failing and our communication, et cetera, but we need to be really purposeful about what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve uh, equality. So we're trying to give people the opportunities to get there. So when we have promotions, we want an equal mix of people that we're choosing from. When we have recruitment, we want an equal pot of people to choose from. We don't want it to be one or the other that we're... Um, so I think that's, that's the challenge we have, and I think we need to be quite careful with that. Yes, the constant feedback I have from my partner, who may or may not be in the room, is um, if all Paula's doing is making things easier for already privileged white middle-class women, you're not really doing enough, Justine. So. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Which, you know, I entirely agree with. So it's good to have it over the dinner table quite often. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, where have you hit the? Where, where have you found some bumps? Uh, so I suppose we're um, we're pretty early in terms of our experiment with ownership. In particular, we only uh, launched that to our team middle of the year, and we're just about to give them the first opportunity for those shares as well. I think the um, the thing that we've found interesting to work through is you know because we're really committed to this idea of shared ownership, but what does it mean in terms of a consensus model and decision making? Because, you know, we're obviously trying to balance that desire to give people ownership, but you also need a governance structure where somebody needs to have decisions. And I should be really clear, you know, the model until we reach a certain tipping point is that, you know, myself and Julian, we're the... Um, we're sort of the majority shareholders and we do retain ownership and control of the company. So I think it's sort of finding that balance between, you know, we're no longer a benevolent dictatorship, but we're not quite a democracy. So what does that sort of mean in terms of, you know, how do you build a consensus culture? And, and it's been great because what we're seeing is that everyone is very invested in terms of, and everybody is asking really good questions. So we need to, it's driving things like need to be really transparent about our business model. Everybody in our practice knows exactly what the financial performance of the practice is. They know our revenue, they know our cost base, they know all of that, they know our profit, they know how much the directors personally have invested in the business. And we think that's a really good thing. But it also, um, you know, I think... The reaction that we've had from other people has been really interesting too, from other business owners. So we've had a lot of interest, not just within architecture, also outside as well. And we've had a lot of people react with mild horror <laughs> and to sort of say, you know, are you sure you want to do this? You know, what about this and what about that? And when you work through a new shareholders agreement, the really fun part is you get to catastrophize about everything that might possibly go wrong. So, you know, you have to work through a lot of that. You can't plan for everything. You can't let the perfect, be the enemy of the good. Sometimes you just got to go, it's enough. We think it's good enough. But I think, um, you know, working through that, you know, what does it mean to kind of, if you really want to kind of share ownership and share decision making, you know, how do you balance that with the need to still have really clear kind of direction? And mm. that I think is going to be a big challenge for us over the coming years, but a, a good one. Mm -mm -mm. Patty. So I think the big challenge these days for us, and it's not just a women, men thing, it's just the talent, finding talent, because I don't know if it's like that here, but definitely in LA and in the States, um, that mid-level person, the person, that critical juncture when people decide whether they want to stay or leave the profession, they're, they've, they don't exist. Okay. <laughs> so that's really a challenge we have because we are um, bottom heavy. We have a lot of junior staff, but they need that kind of mid, and then we have a lot of leadership mm. staff, but we need that mid-level mm. to really be the intermediary. Mm. And so that's, that's, and then on top of that, you're trying to always be balanced in when you hire a male, you want to hire a female. Mm. So it just, it makes it, it's tough. Mm, mm. And also, I mean, economic cycles have so much to do with that too. So, I mean, you know, 
I graduated from a recession almost no one I went to school with as a practitioner. So, you know, there was no, and I, and I think that plays out really long term. <coughs> those kinds of levels of experience. Um, the other thing, you know, there seems to be a bit of a trade going on in senior women in, uh, in architectural practices at the moment because you know senior women are in demand. Um, but you know, the recruiters will tell you there's just not that many of them, and there's not that many of them because they weren't supported when they were mid-level women, and they left, and they, you know, the stuff that Jill and um, Jill and Valerie were showing us. And so I, th you know, I think there that that midpoint in how you how you retain people through what I heard Julie once call the valley of death of the show. <laughs> so if you have children. <laughs> Um, okay, where are we at? I think, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm really tired. Um, <laughs> I think we might open to the floor. Um, and in particular, where's Jude Barber? <laughs> <laughs> Jude, can you talk a little bit about the employee ownership um, models that you've been oh. working through? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, I, I really enjoyed hearing, actually, all about your practices and how varied they are in terms of scale and, 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 out, and outcomes. Um, I, um, I was really interested to hear obviously from yourself, Stephanie, about you, know, you moving into employee ownership. So we've been 100% um, employee owned for 12 years. Um, we're 50 people and um, I think um, for us it's almost like a bedrock of the practice. Um, that notion of financial and intellectual uh, ownership is key to all aspects of equity. I think it, the the thing that you know, as we were talking earlier, I, I, the things that were running through my mind were that idea of sort of structural, you know, equity, which really ultimately comes down to labour and pay, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, ownership is at the kind of heart of that. Um, and I thought like the, the challenges you were saying, Stephanie, you might like come across in terms of. Uh, governance, decision making, transparency, those are all the things that we've, you know, over the last 10 years had to kind of navigate. So be totally happy to talk about that at length need to talk <laughs> <laughs> at any point. And, and actually, I think um, Scotland, um, when we became employee owned, there was very few uh, models that we could look towards. And we obviously looked at the cooperative movement, which is a sort of, you know, absolute um, uh, uh, excellent uh, model in terms of, you know, one member, one vote. We've, we've got that in terms of our governance structure. Um, but now the, there were very few sort of um, places you could go for advice and now the, the Scottish government have really got a whole section of the sort of Scottish enterprise um, model which advises businesses who are moving into this and are really promoting it as a sort of sustainable um, practice for all businesses of all kinds. But I would say it really, really sits particularly well with um, architectural practice where, you know, the notion of a pyramid structure just is at complete odds with the method of designing and the creative process. Um, and so I think that was the question I had about um, equity within all of your practices around um, decision making and the opportunity for creative um, uh, input into projects. How do you create that equitable environment within your, 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 your businesses for design, you know, in terms of how you might do that? I think it's a really good point that, you know, there's an implicit kind of relationship between architectural practice and those types of models. And I would say also with things like B Corp as well. I'm, I'm very surprised. There's only three B Corps that are architectural practices, which just seems stunning to me because, you know, all of those values and principles should be so aligned with, you know, the way architects think and what they value. They're people that inherently want to have meaning in their work. You know, they're not necessarily driven by financial reward. And yet, Translating that, I think, into ownership structures and and def definitive practices doesn't seem to be quite happening at the rate that it should. Uh, for us, you know, I think, you know, that move to that ownership structure, which really we sort of talked about from the start, has certainly influenced a whole range of things in terms of the way that we design. You know, we're only a 15-person studio, so it's kind of easy to do that. So we start all projects kind of with a, a skis where everybody gets involved because often people need to move in and out of projects. So it's really helpful to have everybody in the studio across the conceptual framework and to have been involved from the outset as well. So it's quite pragmatic to do that. But also, you know, often it's the student in the office who has the most amazing precedent or idea or approach to something. So we're very interested in tapping into the full potential of 
all of our people, not just in terms of design, but also in terms of non-project activities. So everybody is involved in various areas of practice management. They have the opportunity to be involved in understanding marketing or finances and so forth. And we think that's an important part of the apprenticeship of architecture that people learn about the business side of things as well. When you have the smaller office, you have to wear a lot of hats. Totally, yeah. And I, I would say that the design process is quite similar in, off, in our office. We don't have the luxury of having everybody work on every project, but um, we'll, we'll try to do pinups as much as we can. But really, it's at the point where we don't have like one, one or two senior people dictating the design. It's so true. The people coming out of school are amazing, yep. amazingly fast, like much faster than we could have ever been. <laughs> And it's just so refreshing to like, they feel like they really have ownership and authorship for their, these projects, so. Mm, mm. And how do you manage that in larger practices? Oh, I mean, that was one of the things that I really liked about Grimshaw. I think um, Nicholas Grimshaw himself left like a really good legacy where, you know, the, you know there didn't have to be life beyond Nick Grimshaw. Like it, it was just so organic and it's just continued on. And uh, a lot of our projects start with design charrettes. And I completely agree that some of the best ideas come from students. You know, someone's sitting there looking at their BIM model all day and they've got that amazing idea that you just haven't seen because you're looking at it all from different directions. Mm -hmm. And I think we really re need to recognize those kind of different roles and the different values of those roles in architecture. But, um, but just on that point as well, I think um, that also gives rise to different ways of working in uh, teams. Mm -hmm. We, I, I think generally as architects, we work in a very uh, vertical way and I think what's happening with a lot of women so when we see women leaving the profession uh, you know they, they have their children they get through a, a wherever they get to it still continues to be hard and and I think they get to a point where you know when you are a project architect or in these quite important roles you get given so much information to take on board that having a structure that is a little bit more horizontal means that, that if you were the site architect you could share the role mm -hmm. like share it between three people why are we laboring so much information on one person because we're so stuck to this like vertical structure mm -hmm. and I think when you look at kind of you know different people and different roles people make you start moving into like a much more bubble structure rather than a, you know this typical oh we need a partner a, a associate you know you know you need these certain ingredients it's just kind of looking at the end result yeah I, I think there's two aspects to it um we have um design conversations weekly because we needed to kind of get a rigor into it that they actually happened and they're on the entire team is there so we get that um, broader input of ideas and generally the process is quite collaborative so no matter what um, level of experience you're at if you're working on that you sit around in, in the butter paper conversations it's not people tied to a desk around that but I think it would be naive of us to um, think that the impact for fresh grads coming into practice and realizing maybe some of the stuff that actually goes on and the lack of creativity in certain things isn't there and the and then the impact of their wellness um is quite huge and i think when the work that was done by the arb in new south wales i think taught a little bit to that uh, amongst other things so we found that quite useful in um going through that talk and taking out the aspects and say okay how we where do we look to tackle that and help out and those kind of things and i know it's not exactly it but as creative people the outlet doesn't have to be just in projects so mm -hmm. you'd be surprised the um social committee at bba and then ask me what we do is they go nuts like they do they produce these amazing videos when they want to highlight the christmas party and they, like it goes off and then we do it <laughs> like we do this thing where you set and there's competition and now i think it's to make a two-minute video and everybody has to do it so we did it last year for around it and teams went bananas like they just spent so much time and we threw some contest points at us so people like it was worth going after um <laughs> But there's, there's other aspects to create little creative outlets for people. And it's not just in projects. And you have to be mindful of that it's somebody sitting there drawing partitions all day or they're doing mm -hmm. toilet layouts. And that might be not what they thought they were going to be doing after a six hours <laughs> of things or not on this scale. And it can be for, a little, especially in bigger projects, it can be for quite a time. So what we look for is let's make sure there is creative outlets in other aspects of the student. They can get involved in other things. Um, so whether we do it well enough, I'm not sure. It's, I always say it's great to, well, our people will tell you better than anything what they do, but we're aware of it, and I think we could be better. 
I think that's a really important point, though, about the idea around design, that it isn't just limited to projects. Like, I think we talk a lot within the practice about designing the practice, you know, and obviously we're very new, so we need to think about that as well, but it is a creative process. So when you're designing systems around staff reviews or staff engagement or branding standards, all of that, those are creative projects and you need to design them in the same way that you do a building. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Do we have any other? Yes. We've got lots. Michael. Uh, thanks for a great discussion. Um, I was just wondering if you see the world in a similar way in that um, you're all sort of promoting a, I suppose, a future where uh, creative, creativity is sort of nurtured through excellent practice. But you're all sort of in a, a, um, a market with other practices and some of them are successful. And I'll, I'll name, you know, Bjark Ingalls, for example who essentially do a case bash. We'll, we'll do more designs than anyone else. We won't pay overtime. And because we've done more designs, we can select out of a greater number of designs. Therefore, we will get better work. How do you, do you, do you see it as a, as a competition of sort of the, the progressives versus the ancients or? It's, it was an interesting one. I mean, I work in Clerkenwell, which well, so we're literally surrounded. There. Apparently there's more architects than rats in that area of London. <laughs> but, um, and it's quite interesting because people will, the students will flock, you know, they will go and work at OMA in, in Rotterdam and work 20 hour days for a year and then go, you know, I can't do that forever. And it, it's quite interesting. I saw um, Bianca talk um, a couple of months back and I didn't want to like him. Like I don't like his work, but um, he was amazing. You know, he used to be an actor. Like, he's so engaging in his storytelling. But also the kind of the way that they work in Copenhagen, I find amazing as well. So when they talk about overtime, you know, sometimes they say overtime in, in Copenhagen. They are talking sometimes about working just after five. Like, it's, it's quite an interesting um, model for, for working. And I know that, that that's not the case world over, and he's got a number of officers. But um, it's... Oh, I can't remember where I was going with that. But, the, um, but you, no, you're right. There is a competition between different uh, architecture studios. I think we don't need to be in competition with other people. I think uh, part of we need to be cognizant of the fact we want to recruit great talent. So perhaps there are things that we'll just try and be a little bit better on or, you know, if that's, if that's the case. But I think the strong driver is a sense of purpose. And I, I think you were getting at this before with B Corp. You know, people, people are um, motivated by money to a certain extent. And then after two months, they're not. You know, people are motivated by purpose for long term and for health and well-being for a longer term. And I think that's the kind of place we want to work in. So for us, it's much more about our identity and who we want to be in the world. And hopefully that, again, will attract the right clients and the right people to work with us. Does anybody else want to answer that? Um, go on. Sorry. Um, I also think that, you know, you'll go to a conference like this and you'll hear a lot of things and it's really kind of you're taking and drawing upon it and thick you know, fitting it to what your practice is. And it's not just like one size fits all by any means. The parlor guides were amazing for me when I discovered them. What was that, 2000? Well, I discovered them like 2015. Yeah. But it was amazing because it was finally something in writing, something that was beautiful and user-friendly for architects. Mm -hmm. And she didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> um, but it was just really incredible. And I think always keeping in mind that I don't have to do all of this stuff, but I can take the things that are really, things that are relevant to, our, to my practice and apply them. And I think that's really helpful and liberating, I think, to have th that there. But I think also too, you know, thinking about how do you define success oh. as well. Do you yeah. know? I think that's really important, and that's something that people need to do for themselves, and you need to do that for your practice as well. So, is it about working on a particular type of project, or is it about creating a particular sort of practice? You know, the, the experiences people have within the practice matter just as much as the buildings that you produce as well, and that's a legacy as well. So, I think you know, thinking about that, you know, what are we trying to achieve? How do we measure success? Is it just about the projects that we build, or is it about a broader idea? Yeah, and, and I, I think if you look at it, I think the stat is something like in 2030, 75% of our practice will be millennials. And you look what they want, they want strong career, career progression, they want feedback. So we, we've got to create a culture in place, irrespective of how amazing design is. They want it all, and we're going to have to give it to them. And I think competition can be a healthy thing too, in terms of raising the bar. Um, uh, New South Wales Institute has brought out the new Best in Practice Prize. And in doing that, 
when they launched it and came out, nobody had ever seen before and do it, but it kind of set the bar to kind of go, this is what you're going to be judged on. And I think when we all dived into it, it was a bit like, oh, geez, we've got to be, we've got to, we've got to deal with all this, which is a great thing. Now, anybody who would have gone into that and say, oh, we're not ready for it, is out there now getting ready so they can enter next year. Mm -hmm. And that's just good for the industry. So competition can be a good thing. And the way I see it is, Yes, it'd be great to raise the bar in the industry, but we shouldn't just stop there. We should be the best employers full stop, not in architecture. Let's, like, let's, that's where we should be aspiring yeah. to do. It's like, yes, understand what we need to do, raise that bar, and then go again. And that's the thing. So I think, and where I'm getting to is, then we will get the best people in, we'll get the diversity, we'll get all these things, we will keep them, and inevitably... I'd like to see that from a, a design perspective and how the social impact and all these impacts we can have on things will just get better. Mm -hmm. And don't kid us, because you need the people, you need the caliber of people to do that, irrespective. You look around big and you look at it and we would a guy who worked in our Brisbane studio who went to big in New York and he's come back to the New York studio and while well, he said he talked about it and we talked to him about what's it like in there and the different aspects, but it's not for everybody and it's not like sustainable for everybody and how they want to go about practicing. And I don't underestimate the importance of, um, especially as we get better talking about all aspects of balance, just proper balance. And when I say balance, in, in different aspects of your life, because it means different things to different people, and we've got to be able to deal with that for everybody. So I was on the jury for that award, and um, we got a, uh, there was quite a, a, a decent number of entries, and there was some very, very, very impressive material in those entries, and it, I have to say, I just felt very heartened because we do hear a lot of horror stories all the time and um, there are a whole lot of practices that are certainly trying very hard to uh, head somewhere else. So um, I know we've got other questions, but I also just want to ask a quick question because I've thought of it and I've got the microphone, um, which is, you know, we're, you're all directors, you're all quite senior, so what are the... Um, what do you say to young employees uh, who, um, I mean, where do they find their agency in all of this? And one of the things I would say is you shop around and, you know, you mm. might be in a practice for a certain time and you might get what you can out of it and then you move on if, if it's a practice to move on from. Um, but where would you all think that employees can find their agency in some of this? So I... <laughs> sorry. So... Um, like in LA, we have the Women in Architecture mm -hmm. Group. We also have AWA plus C, Architecture mm -hmm. for Women in, in Design. Um, I'm sure there, whatever city you're from, there, there's a group. Or if there isn't one, start one. You know, there's plenty of people to talk to. But I feel like those kind of just talking, telling your story, mm -hmm. listening to others, and then networking, I think that's really, you know, I, I, I am hopeful that in 10 years, I don't know, that we don't need to have these kind of symposiums and conferences. Right? I, I'm very hopeful <laughs> for the next generation because I feel like they're so, they just think differently. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think that I'd encourage people to take, take initiative and actually take control of their own circumstances to a large degree. I think, uh, you know, in my experience, we, we recently did a whole survey on wellness and we're building a wellness strategy because one of our graduates said, I think we need this as well. And I think a lot of... Uh, employers and owners would be really, would love it if somebody came to them and said, you know, can we do this, can we not do this? You know, obviously that takes time and energy. Um, if you are doing that within a practice and you're not getting anywhere, certainly persevere, but at a certain point, I mean, I remember... Run. Well, I remember being in a situation where I was feeling quite um, down hard because I wasn't really, didn't feel like I was getting anywhere and I got some lovely well-meaning advice from somebody saying, you know, it's a big ship and it takes time to turn, but at a certain point, you just need to get a different ship or build your own ship. You know, it's, yeah. it's at a certain point, you know, you, you need to take control of that yourself and you need to vote with your feet, I would suggest. And I think, it's a I think it's healthy to work in a number of different offices because yeah. I think a lot of people look at their office and go, yeah, it's great, it's flexible, it's supportive, and they really don't know what those things mean or what they look like because they're, they're, you know, it's seen as a, a profession of long hours. You know, it's that's seen as the norm. So it, it's hard to actually understand culture until you're in it. So having a look around at that. But I, I would hope that um, people have the agency to, um, to discuss things in our, in our office, but we try and make connections as well outside of the office. So there's a, there's a number of different ways people can talk. But, um, but I also think, uh, I think there's really strong power in uh, mentoring. You know, having a mentor, and someone told me once they should, you should have three mentors. I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I have time for that. But the, um, 
<laughs> but, but perhaps you should. Like, you have mentors for different reasons, and they give you advice just when you need a bit of, you know, and, and, I'm, I'm, you know, and people will say yes. People have asked me to be their mentor, and I'm like, so, so happy. It's like, oh my God, yes, of course I will. So, you know, just going out and asking people, it's such a compliment to be asked, and people generally don't say no. But also, we've been talking about advocacy, you know, so it's, it's one thing to kind of mentor people and go, okay, you should go this way. But I think there's an extra step and you go, look, you know, I know this amazing person, they'd be great for this. Yeah. You know, ringing up other firms, talking to other people and helping that person progress through their career. Sponsorship. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the other aspect, it, it's funny how, especially when your practice gets a bit bigger, how you have to encourage different people to talk to each other. So we had to, um, we formed the early careers group, so people from students to five years grads and it's interesting, like half of them didn't even realize there were other students because they kind of came in and did their thing and you connected them so that was a great space for them to talk about the things that were impacting them and what what was important to them at that time and now what's been fabulous is they're starting to connect to the early careers groups and the other practices and it's that thing which is really good for which is going to elevate um, what we do in practices is it's Early in your career, you share way more about it. You talk mm. about what salary you're on, you talk about mm -hmm. every aspect yep. in it, which is a good thing. Like it's, we, they should be out there and checking out mm. and holding us to account and coming back and saying, well, and such and such, that's what they're doing. Why aren't we doing that? Mm. And that's the thing, because our, the cultures need the input and the ideas from everybody. Mm. Not, and that's the thing, in, in these forums, when they come to us, they go, okay, well, this is it. And we go, okay, well, who's passionate about that? And let's, let's make something happen. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, build on your question and to s an idea that came up earlier by asking, have any of you worked with um, motivation by purpose through civic engagement? And I'm thinking of an office I... Uh, had a relationship with in Seattle that did that. They did a lot of civic engagement in the city, which increased their reputation mm -hmm. for getting certain kinds of projects. But it also gave them an opportunity to uh, allow younger people to take leadership roles on civic engagement projects. And I'm just wondering if any of you have worked with that idea. We, we've just started doing it. We realized that we were kind of in a place where our projects just ended up being huge. So for our students, it's really quite challenging because it's a long time before they're on site or before they're engaging in you know, a number of the processes they need, particularly for registration. Um, and also feeling a little bit disengaged. Um, and so what we did was we set up, um, uh, we're not allowed to call it philanthropy, so I need another word for it. Not philanthropy. So um, a, a section of work where it's, it's, it's about community engagement. So we've just started doing a, uh, a library for a youth center. And, but literally, we have some of our staff uh, helping uh, design it, construct it, but like looking at you know, what they need. But the, I think the sense of purpose by doing these extra things, when we realized that maybe some of our projects weren't covering that side of things, that that was missing from our, you know, some of our work, and just having the kind of easy win and that, that real hands-on engagement with people um, was missing. So, so, having, so supplementing our work with projects like that and also looking at how, well, I mean, we're a big firm. We can give a lot back and we have the potential to do that. So we should be. So, and, and people find, um, it, it's particularly for our younger staff, they're so engaged in things like that. They were so excited about doing these. So we're, we've got three projects about to run at the moment um, and I'd, I'd really encourage um, people to do this because people, when you talk about volunteering and we give them a bit of time during our work hours, they're quite happy to do it on their weekends. You know, it's just, you know, we give them a platform to do however they want to do it. Um, and uh, basically the enablers and, um, and create the opportunities for people to do that. Uh, so we've introduced a policy whereby people can take time off for volunteering for different things, but we've also talked a lot about how we can embed that in our projects as well. And we're lucky in that the nature of our projects, because it's sort of schools and community facilities, there's huge opportunity for that. So it's actually part of the process of delivering the project as we start with community consultation, obviously, and, you know, that's quite labour intensive, which means everybody in the office has to get involved in it by definition as well. Um, but we've been trying to give opportunities to uh, some of the, the graduates and students to actually lead parts of those processes mm -hmm. as well, which they found incredibly rewarding. I'm just going to keep going with Louise. Did you have a question? Th 
Thank you. Thank you for your contributions. Um, it's been really wonderful. I've been really heartened by a lot of things that you're saying that I can connect with my own experience and thinking of my own colleagues and peers and how their experiences have been in the industry or exiting from the industry. And um, I'm an educator and I got into education because I was interested in the transition from education into practice. And recently we've been talking to a lot of um, students and practitioners and one thing that uh, came up was the issue of getting that experience. How do you get in the door, get that experience to become registered? And it became this real um, concern of uh, from both the students of just wrapping themselves up into knots of how do they get that opportunity because they see that some people get it and other people don't. So they're willing to literally give themselves mm -hmm. away. To, to get this because they're seeing it as I need this to become registered or to take, um, be able to lead the path that they want to, to lead. So I, I was wondering what advice you would give to young graduates coming out as to how to negotiate that or how, how in their role of where they want to please people and get their foot in the door but also um, be able to no negotiate that space. And pay their rent. Yeah. yeah I'm <clears throat> the thing I think you should remind them is that when they go to interview, they're interviewing the employers as well. Mm. And they should be saying, well, how are you going to support me to do registration? There's that thing we talked a little bit about last night, is, the, is it's not about us looking and seeing whether you're going to come to us. In a way, you're going to sell why why you would pick BBN over Grimshaw or anybody else. It's like because in the market where it is. So if you think of it like that and go at it and start to go how you frame it, uh, I think you'll find that um, it's important to push it back onto the employer and say, well, how are you how are you going to do this? And I think we've had to do it because that's the only way you're going to a attract the, the right people and b you're going to hold on to them. And um, the thing of you can make it work, it's certainly, especially in the practice of scale, because you can move, you can move them between projects, and then they're, they're less. And what we find is, rather than have people, sorry, if you step back, we try to encourage them to have conversations around career where they talk about where they want to go, mm. and then how we will support them to get there. And when you talk like that, and you can articulate the kinds of experience you're looking to get, you're more open to what typology or what stage of jobs you're going to be on, and you get less of, I want to be on an education project. It's actually, here's a project, and then we can talk to them and say, here's a project opportunity, it meets all the aspirations you have to that, are you keen? And they go, yeah, I mean, let's go and do it. And I think in that, we have to get better at all those conversations with helping them and coaching them to be able to have better conversations about how you go about um, progressing their mm -hmm. career. And every project needs to be that. It's a vehicle to take them to the next, wherever they need to be developing and learning in that, irrespective of what kind of experience it was, that it's, it's a dual thing. It's not, oh, I was on an amazing project, but it was pretty cheap and I didn't learn anything. Mm -hmm. we have to, they have to demand and we need to be pushing them that they stretch. We, uh, the Bartlett does an amazing um, thing. They do a lot of amazing things. But they, um, they have a, uh, at the end of part one and part two, they have mentoring workshops um, for the students who are about to go into, the, uh, into practice. And it's, it's actually really helpful to, uh, to connect with them at that point because uh, you can actually talk through what we're expecting in the interview. So sometimes, you know, appearing in an interview and then asking them to say what they want, you know, they don't, they don't because they go, oh, I'm too nervous. I don't know what to say. So giving them that little bit of insight before they even go into the interview in terms of how to direct um, that, to navigate through that process, I think is really helpful from the outset. But, in, but also rec remembering that um, like the RIBA has um, certain obligations for us to support um, students through, through their um, registration exams and give them the appropriate um, experience as well. So, you know, we do have obligations to students. And in Australia, there are provisions within the architect's, aw the architect's award around, you know, studying for registration, blah, blah. I can't remember what they are, but they're there. So, again, if you're young, know the award. Um, We've got to wrap up, but does anyone else have some quick advice for students? Oh, the only thing I was going to add to that is, and maybe this is just about an approach, is to maybe think about what it is that you have to offer 
Do you know what I mean? So, you know, actually, rather than saying, you know, what can you give to me? What is it that I have to offer? Which is probably advice for anybody, regardless of whether they're mm -hmm. a student or what level of experience, because, you know, if you can be clear about what that is, it then becomes a reciprocal conversation. But, you know, if I interview somebody and they say, my passion is public work, I want to do community work, I'm interested in that, and I'm doing all of these things because of my passion for it, that's the sort of person that I want to work with. You know, as opposed to somebody saying, well, you know, what can you give to me, I think? So it's a bit... Mm, harsh definitely. advice maybe yeah. but, but I think it's really true is that you know that's how you find your purpose that's how you find what matters to you and that's how you'll you'll be good at what you do yes I mean I think uh, like you Louise I've read a lot of comments from practitioners whinging about how students don't know enough and the graduates don't know enough and they're not work ready and all I can say is people have been saying that for 100 years as we know and they said it about all of us and um, you know those those young people coming into the profession, they don't know the same things, but they know a lot of things. And so, again, I'd say, and how can you, how do you pitch that? And, and I wouldn't underestimate, uh, as an industry, we're inclined to focus too much on the techni their technical ability. And I think get them to learn, back to Steph's point, is their ability to articulate their attitude and their behavior, like to, to collaborate and to be in, in teams and, um, attitude is a huge element. If you've got the right attitude, we can teach. We can teach you the technical stuff. We can teach you Revit. We can teach you Ryan Grass. We can we can help you in that aspect. And the other side of it is, and we're starting to just, and the reason why not just students, uh, we need to um, help all the people in our uh, practice. And actually, I think this comes back to a fundamental ab about how um, particularly women or anybody in practice can feel undervalued is we don't teach people how to talk well about someone else. So in order to be able to sponsor them or in anything, say to have a conversation, it's normally a one-liner, oh, Angela's a great designer. Thanks. Is that it? <laughs> that's all the thing. Well, I'll that's, take well it. that's great. And yeah, you will. But there's much more to that because, and it's, that's why you, and they have it in the IT industry about the brilliant jerk who's brilliant technically but can't collaborate or they can't really work with other people. So if we get students who understand that their ability to problem solve and with a really good attitude, they can acquire technical skills as they go along. And if we talk to all our people in that realm and say, here are the different aspects that you need skills in and that we expect of you, I think we'll become much better. And then project leaders can talk better about their people. We can then differentiate performance, which when you come back to actually how people move through practice, I think we'll be better for everybody. Excellent.